The compact crossover segment is huge, and with the new 2023 HRV, Honda is finally catching up with the competition. Today we're going to check out all the features and then take it for a drive. That's coming up right now on Driving Sports TV. Last year's HRV was a likable but limited crossover. Based on the fit, it just simply wasn't big or powerful enough for North American buyers. For 2023, Honda is finally taking the segment seriously with a larger and more powerful HRV. It's finally set up to compete against the Subaru Crosstrek and the Toyota Corolla Cross, two of the big heavyweights in the space. On the outside, Honda has increased the width by 2.6 inches. Overall length is increased by 8.7. Even the wheelbase is 1.7 inches longer. The elongated hood and sculpted corners certainly give it a more upscale look, especially when compared to the tiny and tinny HRV of the past. It even has a new multi-link suspension setup in the back, which should help it handle twisty roads with more confidence. Even though it is based on the same architecture as the Civic, Honda stresses that this vehicle is actually very different underneath. The HRV we're testing today is the top level EXL trim with all wheel drive. It features a power moonroof, parking sensors, leather seats, and a nine inch infotainment system with wireless CarPlay and Android Auto. This EXL trim comes standard with 17 inch wheels and they are wrapped in Hankook Kinergy GT tires. These are an all season radial. Now, one thing I want to point out, this vehicle has seven inches of ground clearance. If you get the Sport trim, it has 7.3. The reason for that is the Sport has 18 inch wheels and a slightly larger tire. That's it. If you want more ground clearance, get one of these with the 17 inch wheel and just get a thicker sidewall tire. Prices you see it here, 30,590 US dollars, including destination. The color of this vehicle is Nordic Forest Green. It is a $395 option. Under the hood of every HRV is the same two liter four cylinder VTEC engine. Here it puts out 158 horsepower and 138 pound feet of torque. EPA rates this at 25 miles to the gallon in the city and 30 on the highway. In the back, we have manual lift gate. What you're looking at is 24.4 cubic feet with the second row in place. Fold it down for up to 55.1. Even though it may not be as big as the old HRV, it's at least competitive in the segment. It basically has the same cargo capacity as a Subaru Crosstrek. Under the floor, a lot of foam for sound deadening. And heaven to Betsy, we have a full size spare tire. Back here, we also get a 12 volt power socket. Oh, interesting to note also, no, you cannot get this with a power lift gate. It is a manual lift gate only, even in the highest trim. But they don't make a touring model yet, so maybe in the future. The prior generation HRV had a really cool magic seat that would flip flop and give you just tons of room. This one doesn't have it. But the reason why that may not be a bad thing is because the old magic seat wasn't terribly comfortable. You see, it was like sitting on planks. That's how they made it so compact when it was folded. Now, Honda has finally added padding back here and it is a lot more comfortable. Now, is it great for three hour road trips? Probably not for an adult, but it's not bad. Now, one thing to note is that this is a top level EXL trim. That's the highest level you can currently get. I get, I have a blank faceplate here for options. I have a cubby. I don't have vents. I don't even have a fold down armrest. I do, however, have a nice touch sensitive light, but the door's open, so they're just on. I do like these though. These are really nice. Also get a little tweeter back here. powered up. I mean, I can say already, this is so much better than the outgoing HRV. This feels like a grown up car. And actually it has a lot in common with the 
brand new Civic. We have the same kind of honeycomb grille here with vents behind it, which is really nice. Uh, below that, we even get a dual zone climate control at this trim level, another really nice feature. The seats are very well padded. I get power controls. Uh, the passenger has manual controls, however. I even get three stages of heat. How nice is that? Over on the wheel, it is leather wrapped, again, because this is an EXL. Uh, the leather also continues onto the transmission selector there. Now, the gauge cluster is an interesting hybrid approach. On the right is a Speedo that is your traditional uh, analog speedo. On the left, we have a multi-function digital cluster, and I can toggle through all sorts of information here. I have uh, the all-wheel drive torque distribution screen, driver attention, navigation, phone, audio, speed and time, range and fuel, warnings, gauge control settings, all sorts of fun stuff. So that's kind of nice. So you can kind of customize your display. And then overall, the graphics here, very nice. They're clean, they're easy to read. I especially like the topography they picked. Uh, it's a really nice looking font. And then buttons for controlling everything, including both the gauge cluster, the stereo, and the adaptive cruise control system with lane centering, which is standard at this trim. That is very nice and compact on the wheel. And then the wheel itself just feels great. Very nicely done interior i love actually i really like this interior now granted it is really dark uh, but there are other trim colors you can get and this one even though it's black down below it does have a light headliner to kind of give you a light feeling when you're looking up visibility pretty good that c pillar is on the thick side so you're going to be relying on mirrors and sensors and this does have uh, blind spot identification in fact the whole advanced safety setup in this is really nice this has Honda's latest single camera uh, advanced safety package. What that does is it uses a camera system for collision mitigation, as well as adaptive cruise control with lane centering. Um, it also, on top of that, has blind spot identification. Put it in reverse, and we get a rear camera with tracking lines. Hi back there, Nick. Yep, there it is. Uh, which you can change the different angles, and I can enable or disable the cross traffic alerts right there. And that brings us up to this infotainment system, which is really quite nice. Since this infotainment version came out a few years ago on Hondas, I really like it and I'm glad it's finally made its way to the HRV. Um, on the left, you'll notice we have physical volume knob. Honda learned its lesson there, but we also get a physical home back and forward and reverse track. Over here, things are nicely organized. They're color coordinated, so your eye can immediately go to it. Blue is for music sources. Uh, orange is for vehicle. Green is for phone and whatnot. And you can kind of go through all sorts of different control panels here. Uh, this does support Apple CarPlay, and it's not just wired Apple CarPlay, although you do use a wire to set it up. At this trim level, you get wireless CarPlay as well as wireless Android Auto. Let's plug it in right down there with the USB. I did find it interesting that this uses USB-A interfaces. No USB-C, which, hello, 2022, where's my USB-C? So to set this up, I simply plug it in. This is always a little confusing, you know, when you like plug in the wire and then it does the whole wireless setup, boom, and there we go. Okay, so to rewind what just happened there, because it was a little confusing. First, I plugged it in to the physical connection, but I did it down here. It didn't read data from this port. It was a merely power only port. So then I moved up here, which it actually did read data. Great. Um, I plugged it in and asked if I wanted to do wireless, even though I could have also done wireless setup just through Bluetooth. Because it was plugged into the cable, it went through the setup process. Uh, once the setup process was done, I was able to unplug it, but I was still physically connected with the cable, it thought. So then I just had to wait a moment and then it reconnected to Wi Fi. So at this point, whenever I turn the vehicle off and on again, and I get back into the vehicle, it should wirelessly connect, so long as my device is enabled to do that. And then for charging, there is a wireless charging pad here. Uh, the one on this test car, this is a pre-production car, and the pad doesn't work, so it's not gonna light up, but that's where the pad goes there. So. Nice setup, I love it with Apple CarPlay. This is the map system, and I'm not gonna walk you through it because everybody's used Apple Maps or Google Maps, and it's all basically the same, but it does give me access to all of my uh, apps here, uh, which is really handy. And then if I hit a button over here, it'll give me 
uh, my voice integration. So, and if I hold it down long, it'll bump me to Siri's voice integration because it supports Siri. But we're outside of data, so it's not gonna do anything right now. Okay, so there is more to talk about with this new Honda HRV, and that is the real-time all-wheel drive system. Now, what this uses is a clutch in the middle, and it has an electronically actuated hydraulic engagement. Uh, so the computer can tell it when to engage. It doesn't have to wait for all the hydraulics to like get into play. It can connect almost instantaneously. And that means uh, that the system can push power to the back wheels uh, when you need it very, very quickly. And you can override kind of the logic by going from normal to snow mode. If you're in snow mode, it will instantly put power to the back before slip is detected. Now it will also do that on hills and on slippery conditions when it detects it. Um, but if you're just driving around town on asphalt, it will default to front wheel drive for best economy. And in terms of economy, you're looking at about 30 miles to the gallon on the freeway. And I just want to point out, I actually drove down here in a Subaru Crosstrek Sport. That's the one with the larger engine. Uh, and I averaged over 30. I averaged close to 32 miles to the gallon. And that car actually has Falcon Wild Peak all-terrain trail tires on it, which do give you a slight knock on economy. So Honda's trying real hard here. Uh, hopefully this two liter is going to be fun to drive. It's definitely bigger and more powerful than the outgoing HRV, but this vehicle is also larger and heavier. So uh, does it give you that fun to drive quotient? Well, that's what we're gonna find out right now. And punch it. Ooh, I can tell the little torque gauge is showing that torque is going to both the front and rear wheels pretty evenly when I blast the throttle there. Now, immediately, I'm not feeling a lot of torque here. Now, it is a continuously variable transmission, and that is not always ideal for fun driving. However, in sport mode, it will at least emulate a stepped transmission, and that's nice. There's no paddle shifters here. I kind of would have expected them. First drive in the HRV in my backyard in the beautiful Pacific Northwest. Now we are on the southern part of the state. This is right along the Columbia River where we have a real just spectacular variation in the type of roads and conditions. Now let's check this handling. Now the old HRV was based on the fit, which was a fantastic handling little rig, but it was so underpowered, it was basically useless. Let's check it on the corner here. Yeah, it's well composed into the corners and then we slide onto the gravel here. Boom, there we go, not bad. <laughs> Floor it, boom. You can tell that engine's revving all the way up to the 6,600 RPM red line. It kind of makes some not great sounding noises. That's a lot of just But it, uh, it does get up and go. Absolutely, much more fun to drive than the old HRV. Now let's see what happens with that power distribution when I floor it. Yeah, it's putting power to the back. Nice. Yeah, it's not bad. You know, it's quick enough to have a little bit of fun on a forest road like this. Now, can you do a power induced uh, rotation with the vehicle? No, it doesn't put more than 50% of power to the back at any given time in most conditions. Now there is this whole theoretical thing where it could use individual wheel braking to shift more power to the back than in the front, but that's just theoretical and not practical in any, any sense or way. I'm curious if I come to a complete stop and I just go full throttle and I'm just in normal drive mode, will it put power to the back wheel? So I have that little gauge cluster up and yeah, it's instantly putting power. So I'm guessing that on start, it automatically puts power to the back. And then as we wind through the gears, it'll disengage that center clutch as it likes, you know, for better economy. Some people might complain this has a CVT, but CVTs are very good for economy. And that is one of the key points on a small vehicle. People buy based on economy, especially today, now that gas prices are you know, around $6 for regular fuel. Now that's not always gonna be the case, but for right now, it's reality. And people that can get 30 MPGs are loving it. Oh boy, getting up to speed, oh, it just makes such a racket. 
Yeesh. Let's try a zero to 60. I'm gonna put the transmission into sport so it should step through the different gears. Three, two, one, floor it. Ah, oh, slow. 20, 30, 40. Shifting at 6,500, 50, and 60. 11 and a half seconds. This thing is not fast. So driving on the highway here, I can really appreciate the longer wheelbase of this vehicle. It tracks so nicely, whereas the old HRV would be really upset by even the slightest variations in the road surface. This one, it just is smooth. A very nice setup compared to the outgoing model. A lot of that has to do with the fact that it now has independent suspension in the back. So now here we are in 2022, we have multi-link in the back, proper suspension, and finally have an HRB that handles appropriately. Along with all the new safety features, Honda has also introduced adaptive cruise control as a standard feature here with lane detection. Now you can toggle lane detection on or off depending on if you want it, uh, but with the adaptive cruise, it will pace the vehicle in front of me. This is kind of a twisty road, but we'll give it a try and we'll see how it does. So right now I'm gonna set my speed. Uh, it is 55 here, so I'm just gonna set it for 55. And that school bus in front of me, as we get closer to it, it'll detect the distance and then pace that school bus at whatever speed you know it's doing to keep a nice distance between us. It's really nice, especially if you're doing like big multi-state travel or you're hitting just off and on traffic and you don't wanna worry about constantly changing the target speed of your cruise control. So we just decrease speed and I don't have to worry about it, I'm just pacing the school bus. So with lane tracing, what that does is it gives you a, a greater assist on the steering wheel so that you're not constantly making little adjustments. Now it's not an autopilot, that doesn't really exist in the US at all, sorry. Uh, this is a level two system, which means that as a driver, I need to be in control all the time. For demonstration purposes, I'm gonna take my hands off the wheel and you can see that it's gonna track right between the lanes. It's a little, making little adjustments here to keep it tracking. And in a few seconds, it's gonna yell at me to, hi kids, it's gonna yell at me to put my hands back on the wheel like it's doing right now. And since the road is turning, you can see that the wheel is turning with the road. So that means you just don't have to work your arms as much on long trips. Is it absolutely necessary? No, but the competition offers it, so it's really good to see it here. Uh, I mean, because your main competition, Subaru Crosstrek, Subaru's EyeSight system is rated as one of the best. Um, and then there's Toyota system, which now offers um, adaptive cruise control on all trim levels. The fact that this has lane centering is just a little bit of whipped cream on top. So this school bus is slowing down. I'm just gonna let the system put the brakes on for me. And if they stop completely, the system should stop completely. I'm doing nothing. Brakes are going slower, slower, slower. He's pulling off, but I can now put my foot on the gas and then continue on. When I take my foot off the gas, it continues to climb up to the target speed. Nicely implemented system. It's smooth, it's gradual, and it works really well. This EXL has three different drive modes, normal, econ, and snow. And they do a few different things. So in normal mode, obviously that's normal. Uh, if you go into econ, what it'll do is it'll keep the RPMs as low as possible. It'll also uh, mute the throttle so that you're not using gas as aggressively. Kind of smooths out the whole driving experience. Um, but also I find it kind of annoying because I don't want to have to push the throttle twice as far to get the same level of acceleration. I just find that silly. Uh, you know what, if you, want, if you want to do that better, just use your foot better. Uh, the third mode is snow, and what snow will do is it'll actually hold gears uh, so you're not shifting uh, in the middle of trying to get through tricky situations. It'll also push more power to those back wheels. It instantly will have power to the back before it detects slip, because of course, once you start spinning the wheels, you're gonna ice up underneath them. So those three modes, kind of what you expect. I am surprised that there is no sport mode, but maybe they're holding that for a future touring model. I don't know. As we're now climbing the mountains, I'm hearing a lot of whining. You hear that? From the CVT, it is just having a heck of a time trying to get me into a happy gear space. It's whining all over the place. 
Come on, I need more power. Oh man, this is, you know, I gotta give credit to Honda for actually including in their drive a steep mountain pass climb because most car makers, if their car would not have excelled in this situation, they would have said, nah. You know, I totally would have seen some other car makers launching a product with this much horsepower, you know, in Austin, Texas, for example. Feed everybody nice ribs, put them on a flat surface, call it a day. But here we are climbing a mountain pass in Southern Washington and, oh, it's not liking it though. So if this thing was fully loaded with a family and gear, it would have a heck of a time getting up here. As it is right now, I got my cameraman sitting next to me. I'm in the driver's seat. Um, we got a little bit of gear in the back and it is riding the struggle bus. Okay, I'm, I'm getting bored driving on the highway here. I think it's time to turn off and find some place where we can lift a wheel and see how this all wheel drive system handles challenging conditions. Okay, well, let's try this spot, see how this does. Even though, yes, I do live in Washington State, I don't know this exact forest layout very well. I mean, there are literally tens of thousands of forest roads in this state. So uh, is this one gonna be any good? I don't know, let's find out together. So here, even though the suspension was a little too soft for the asphalt, I'm actually finding it really nice here. What I'm looking for is a big open area where I can really test out the four wheel drive or all wheel drive system on this HRV. Oh boy, puddle. Oof. I do love it out here though. And really a vehicle like this, you know, if you're just going up to say a ski pass, um, that's really kind of the more common use scenario for a vehicle like this. It's not gonna be for off-roading, but we still have to try it because you never know what kind of conditions you'll encounter, especially out here in Washington State or other places that just have a lot of wilderness. Ah, yeah, 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 here we go. It's gonna go off the beaten path. I am officially off-roading right now. And I think right over here, it's not gonna take much to lift a wheel here. I think this will be a good test. So what we have here is a little bit of a drainage ditch. Uh, it's a naturally occurring one. So it gets shallow on the right and then it gets deeper on the left. So I'm gonna have to be really careful with going over this that I don't crunch the nose because we only have seven inches of ground clearance. Also, I don't wanna scrape anything because we don't have any underbody protection on this vehicle. Um, but what I'll do is I'll roll over it and we'll take a look at how the four wheels on the outside of the vehicle work to shift power around. And what we should see is individual wheel braking kicking in to shift that power. If it doesn't, then I'll switch into a different drive mode and see if maybe snow mode will add that feature. Um, but to start with, uh, we're just gonna keep it in normal. Here we go. Go straight, try not to crunch that nose. Ooh, can we do it? Can we do it? I'm dragging just a little bit. Okay, that was no big deal, but we got another hole right over here that we're gonna try. And I'm pretty sure this one is gonna lift not one, but two wheels. The big ditch on the left, and I'm gonna try to hug the right side because I don't wanna crunch the nose of this vehicle. We've already established that the approach angles are not great. So I'm gonna cut over. Okay, so now we should have traction completely removed off one wheel. And the idea here is to basically set this up to fail because we wanna see how it fails and how it responds. So now I'm on an incline. Uh, traction's gonna be a little loose on the left. Put it into snow mode and see if that adds, you know, extra capability for slippery situations. And I'm gonna put the throttle in. Yeah, it's chunking, it's chunking. Are we making progress? No, I just don't feel like it's gonna make progress. So in terms of being able to redistribute power around the system, this vehicle just really isn't up to it. It's, uh, it's lacking proper trail features for any, even the mildest of off-roading. So this, if you're looking for uh, hitting trails or even you know dirt roads where you just don't really know where they're gonna go or what kind of conditions run into, not the right vehicle for you. Let's see. 
See that power shifting to the back? Is it gonna, is it gonna get us up? No, no, we're just spinning wheels. So I'm gonna have to go back a little bit. I'm gonna have to go with some momentum. And then it gets us out. So not everything is great about this car. The front grille, not my favorite. Uh, the all-wheel drive system, it's pretty typical Honda where it's really there for safety. It's not there for uh, slipping the back end out or for extreme off-road adventures. There was one more feature I really wanted to try today, but we didn't find a road that would work, and that is the hill descent control system. Basically, what it'll do is it'll keep your vehicle straight tracking downhill using individual wheel brakes um, in speeds from 2 to 12 miles per hour. And it does that using the throttle or the brake. You add the brake until you're around 2, and then it'll just creep down the hill. And that is better than just putting the brakes on, because you put the brakes on, what it's going to do is try to prevent a slide. With hill descent control, it's going to try to keep you straight. It's like a really advanced stability control system designed for one very specific application. It's been missing on the HRV up until now, and I'm glad they added it. We'll try to use it on a future video. It does have individual wheel braking, though. We did see that on the um, when I put the vehicle into a bit of a ditch, and you could really see it trying to shift that power around, but it just didn't have enough power to be able to shift it all the way to the back to one wheel to get us to climb out of that hole. Now granted, yes, you can use momentum most of the time, but that's not the test, right? We do that with all of these crossovers. We put them into a static uphill position to see if they can climb out by themselves on their own power. Most of them can't. This one cannot. Um, we are gonna do more testing with this vehicle in the future in more difficult situations. Uh, but that's what we could do today in this location. This gauge cluster, I like it, but there's one really weird thing about it, and that is when you move your head even slightly, it's polarized in that you can only see it when you're directly ahead. So uh, Nick's sitting in the passenger seat right now. Let's see a hand. Hi. Um, he cannot see the gauge cluster, so he sees a black gauge cluster, which is really weird. Like, why, why? Is that a visibility thing? Is that, I mean, don't have to worry about glare. It's inset so far. It just seems like a strange decision to make it do that. I've never seen a digital display in a gauge cluster do that before. So if none of those are a problem for you and you're looking for a commuter car that will get you good MPGs, but you can also bring, you know, up to snowy passes uh, with when equipped with proper tires, or you want to like, you know, just do some simple trails, nothing where you're lifting a wheel, just going to a trailhead and going for a hike. This is totally a capable vehicle, but even at seven inches of ground clearance with that front nose, you really have to be careful scraping it even on a deep puddle. You hit a puddle too hard and it's going to be too deep. You're going to have a bad day. So just keep that in mind. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, this is nice to drive. It has features. It's really good about town. Uh, it's also really good on the highway. I would have no problem driving one of these every day, although I do feel like the Subaru Crosstrek, still a little bit better, simply because it has more capability in more challenging situations. For Driving Sports TV, I'm Ryan Douthit. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, share our videos. We make them for you, and I hope you enjoy them.